Hello guys and welcome to a new video about the Great War Western Front. I'm Vulcan and today I'll be talking about the game and all of the information I was shown during a recent online press event. Massive thanks to Frontier and Petroglyph for allowing me to have an early access look at the game and to show it off to you guys. Background footage you will see in the video was recorded from the event, but please remember that the final product is subject to change. So what is the Great War Western Front? For those of you who haven't heard of it, it's a World War I strategy game with both a high-level turn-based campaign and real-time strategy battles. It focuses on the Western Front from 1914 all the way to 1919. The game releases on the 30th of March and there will be a playable demo releasing on the 6th of February, which will be running till the 13th of February. So if you want to try out the game for yourself, that will be the best time to do so. Let's dive in. During the event, I got to see all sorts of features in the game, but let's start with the campaign. There were a few options for the campaign, but we were specifically shown the 1914 campaign. This starts us just after the race to the sea in December, when lines are still being set up and trenches are still being dug. The way the campaign works is somewhat complex, so be ready for an absolute information dump as I talk through what is in front of you in the background footage. To start, you have to manage war funds and supply. This is shown in the bottom left. War funds are used to replenish infantry companies and to buy abilities, buildings, shown at the bottom, and reinforcements such as tanks and planes. Infantry companies cannot be bought and instead are earned through actions and over time in the campaign. However, making sure you have funds to replenish them after battle is vitally important, lest you leave your frontline regiments weak to attack. Supply, on the other hand, is used to fuel your attacks. The more supply you have, the more resources you can use in battle for artillery strikes, air strikes, reinforcements, and other cool abilities. This also depends on the local region as to how much they can utilize from the total amount of supply you have. This can be improved with buildings that I briefly mentioned before. Buildings can also improve other things and you can research more buildings over time. As you can see on the map, each company has its own pip and these can stack. For infantry, this represents roughly 20 units in the real-time battles, but this can vary. Tanks early on had four tanks per pip, and artillery on the map represents siege artillery, which is the equivalent of off-map that can be fired at the start of a battle if you attack an adjacent tile. Normal on-map artillery is part of the infantry companies. Planes are limited and somewhat autonomous in battle. They are given an order and they carry it out on their own. Moving things around on the map is actually quite simple and attacking can be as quick as left click, right click. But choosing when to attack and where to attack is a skill in itself. There are mechanics that can punish over aggression, but if you continue to attack the right place, you can be well rewarded. That being said, Taking territory is usually a multi-turn process as you have to whittle down the opponent's defences and take away the stars before you can actually capture it for yourself. On top of everything already mentioned, there is espionage, which the AI will also use against you, which has a whole array of abilities. There is also research. In 1914, things start pretty basic. But as you move towards 1918, you unlock things like observation balloons, fighters, bombers, new tanks, different types of trenches, uh, battlefield and campaign abilities. It's crazy. There is so much to choose from, but you actually have a limited amount of points to spend. So putting them in the right place and choosing a, a tree you want to focus on is actually quite important. Research points are gained from the end of each turn and from events. And yes, there are also events that provide fun side objectives. But you aren't required to complete them, but they do give you decent rewards, so it's generally worth it. And after all that, you're probably asking, how do I win? Well, at the top, you can see two numbers. These represent national will. 
By winning battles or through events, you can raise or lower your own and the enemy's national will. If you get the enemy's national will to zero, you win the campaign as they will surrender the war. You can also win if you take the opposing military HQ, of which the Allies is in Paris and the Central Powers is in Kreuznach. So that's the campaign side of the game covered. I might have missed a thing or two, it was a lot for me to take in and we only got a few hours to play the game. Overall I was really impressed. The tutorial does a fantastic job of relaying all the information you need to get started and what was overwhelming at the start slowly became easier to manage. So if that felt like a lot to take in, don't worry, the game has a robust tutorial that will help you get into it. Let's now talk battles. A key part of the campaign is real-time battles. There are also historical battles that we got a chance to play too, but I'll get to that later. After a battle is initiated in the campaign, it can be auto-resolved, but I would say 9 times out of 10, you will probably want to play it yourself for the best result. There will be times later in the campaign I reckon when you can be more careless or push overwhelming advantages with order resolve but anyway, once you jump in, it's time to build your trench network. The first time you enter battle between two hexes, you need to place your trenches. These will be persistent and any following battle in the same place will have the same trenches as before. These can then be added to, edited, or replaced if they got destroyed. Other defences like machine gun nests and your artillery positions have to be placed manually every time. This is also the case for your soldiers and any support like tanks. After you are set up it's time for the attacker to push the enemy's trenches. Early on in the campaign the main combination is line infantry, light artillery and heavy artillery. Light artillery is good for suppression and is used to pin enemy forces and fortifications as you approach which stops them from firing at you in no man's land. Heavy artillery is used for destroying fortifications like MG nests and doing substantial damage to units in the open. The rest is down to your infantry. Basic trenches have two spaces, the firing step and the reserve. The firing step is just for that firing out of the trench. The reserve slot is good for strong melee troops or replacements if the unit on the firing step is taking too much damage. When advancing troops get to an opposing trench, a melee ensues. Two units from both sides can fight over a trench at the same time and they will fight until they surrender, run or are destroyed. On the attack you need to make sure you have enough men to get across the open under fire and then win the preceding melee engagement. It definitely takes a little to get the hang of. Now bear in mind that's the basics. As more research is complete you'll bump into all kinds of trenches and defences to utilise or overcome. Fortified bunkers for example give cover against artillery but cannot be fired out of but also not seen into so maybe what you can do is set up a trap with strong melee infantry. Other things such as barbed wire come into play. Making sure to clear it with artillery or run it over with your tanks is important on attack, else your infantry will be slowed to a crawl in the face of incoming fire. Solutions to enemy defences also come with time, such as aircraft to help bomb or undermining to blow up bunkers from beneath. Gas, smoke and different types of barrages also get unlocked, allowing your men to advance behind a creeping barrage for example. I was actually amazed at how much they have included. They genuinely make a fun but harrowing World War I experience. This is more the case than ever in the historical mission we were allowed to play, the Battle of the Somme. Interestingly, I was put in charge of the central powers as we fight back the French and British. I didn't have time to complete the mission but I think that historical missions such as these are an important reminder and learning tool for those less informed. World War I really isn't covered anywhere near as much as World War II so it's refreshing to see. Now just a little bit about graphics. I think overall 
the aesthetics is very pleasant. The campaign is simple in its animations and models, but relays information very well through its UI. In battle, the game kind of reminds me of old school games like Blitzkrieg and Sudden Strike. It's an art style that never ages and legitimately looks fantastic, especially when all of the complex trenches and defenses start coming into play. Persistent craters and damaged buildings is a big plus, and the weather systems are really, really cool, and they also affect the gameplay. For example, soldiers walk slower in snow, making prolonged artillery more important when advancing on enemy trenches. In rain, artillery is less effective because the mud absorbs the shells, so infantry takes less damage. There are just small things like that that are really cool. Either way, it all looks very authentic, apart from potentially disappearing bodies. I'm not looking for gore, but I think persistent bodies would represent the war better and also be a good indicator for players gameplay wise if things are going well or badly. So where do I stand with the Great War Western Front? From what I've seen and played, it was really fun. It really grasped the feeling of World War I on a scale that isn't often represented well. That being said, my biggest gripe with World War I games, this goes from strategy to FPS, is repetitive gameplay. How many times can one man run from one trench to the next before it gets boring? And the gameplay loop in the 1914 campaign on attack really became drop light artillery, run forward into melee, heavy artillery machine guns I see, or otherwise use the heavy artillery for suppression. Also, knowing that I can get a better result than the AI, and so having to play out the same battlefield multiple times in a row, could get tedious. Thankfully, due to the scale of the game, I feel there may be enough depth in events and progression through research to keep things interesting throughout the campaign. Real-time battles certainly become a lot more complex when you start getting later in the war. Overall, it was a great experience, and I would say it has potential to be one of the best World War I strategy games on the market. Again, a big thanks to Frontier and Petroglyph for allowing an early access look at the game. I've tried to keep things concise, so hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think of the game in the comments, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.